this is uh, ME6008-6122 uh, microfluidics. Uh, what we're going to cover today's lecture is flow in rectangular channels. So we're going to go through very briefly the derivation that we did that was sent out on um, a Word document. Uh, so the details of the derivation are uploaded on the SULIS. And I'll just go briefly through that and we'll look at a sort of physical reasoning approach to arriving at a uh, approximate solution to the, the same um, velocity profile as we have uh, in this Fourier series solution. So in essence, what we get out of this, if we just go for is, uh, we got a solution here for the velocity distribution. It looks pretty complex, but what it has is essentially the core features that you'd see in fully developed flow for, uh, a pipe or a parallel plate. So again, we see this delta P over the UL term. Uh, we've got uh, H squared. And then in this section here, what we have is uh, essentially geometric uh, features. So W over 2 for H, Y open H, the coordinates can set up in H here. Okay, so in the Word document that's on Sulis, there's a quite a detailed uh, derivation of this uh, to help you work through it. So you should be able to work through that yourself and understand it. Uh, essentially, what we're doing is we're starting with this governing equation here uh, with our coordinate system. And again, we made the note that our coordinate system starts here uh, and goes from w over 2 to minus w over 2 and 0 to h. So 0 to h is in the z direction. And you may see other ones, and we'll see one later on. There's one a uh, couple of slides on, taken from white. That, um, yeah, where we have the solution here by white, the coordinate system is given here at the center line. And what you'll see from that is that in the Fourier series, they're using a cosine term um, in the z direction. So, um, what they have is by a cosine of zero, we get one. So, it's maximum of this value here. And it'll be zero there and zero down the bottom. And when we go back to uh, our solution, what we're doing is we are imposing a sine term in the z direction. So we'll use a sine term in that. We see that our solution is of this form where we have the n pi z of an h, and in white they have it as the, the cosine term. Again, by using the sine term, what we have here is that the sine is 0, 0, so we get the no slip condition in the bottom wall. And then we have the sine of uh, n pi up in the top. And again, that gives us zero. So we have again the no slip condition valid on the, the top wall in accordance with our uh, boundary conditions. Uh, so our the form of our solution is to write it as two separate functions that are taken as a product. So we have the function fn of y, which is uh, unconstrained uh, outside of the boundary conditions in terms of form. And then we have the, um, the Fourier series approximation where we're using a sine term. Uh, for that. Okay, so we make this substitution, try and find uh, this function fn of y. And if we can find that and multiply it, then we have our solution. Again, we go through the uh, partial derivatives here um, and we reformulate our equation in this form. And what we've done here is we've expressed uh, the value of 1 as a Fourier series. So now we've got everything uh, in terms of a uh, Fourier series. And now we try and solve this, and we're, we're looking for is we're looking for this uh, function f n of y. So for any even terms, it's pretty straightforward. f n of y is equal to zero, so that's a trivial solution. And then we're focused really on the odd values of n, where we're after uh, trying to solve this equation. And this is a, a second order uh, inhomogeneous differential equation. So what we do is we take a particular solution to the inhomogeneous version. So f n of x y, sorry, f n of y is constant. And then we add this to a general solution to the homogeneous equation. Again, the homogeneous equation is simply this thing equals zero. So it doesn't have this term here. We have a general solution to that. And then we find a particular solution to the inhomogeneous one. And we just uh, add the two of them together. So when we do this, uh, we're able to find this as our solution for the Fn. And again, in the Word document, you can see how that is uh, worked through in a bit more detail. So now that we have the fn of y, we simply multiply this by the uh, sine n pi z of an h term. 
uh, which is what we have here, and that gives us the solution to our velocity field. And what we do then is we can integrate this, or we could indeed differentiate it if we're after the um, shear stress distribution, we could differentiate this. Okay, so on slide seven here, what we have is the integration of that to arrive at a flow rate term. So again, what we have is flow as a function of pressure drop. And again, that's typically what we're after in terms of engineers, uh, engineering solutions. Uh, we'd have a particular pressure drop that we can impose, and we just know what flow rate we can get, or we know what flow rate we can put through. We want to calculate what pressure drop we would arrive at. Okay, pretty standard. If you note the form of this, um, this term here is identical to the parallel plate solution. So really what we're seeing is that we, what we have is the parallel plate solution um, with a correction uh, taking place, which is made up of geometry. Okay, and as this um, aspect ratio gets wider and wider and wider, uh, this term will drop off to zero and we're left with just a parallel plate. So it's, it's very convenient to express in this way to get an understanding of what the uh, sidewalls are contributing. Uh, if we take the form given by white, which we have here, again, if we integrate this, we end up with the same expression. Okay. So always when we're using these velocity profiles um, here, you need to be careful in terms of the corner system that is used and also where it is centered. Is it centered at one of the surfaces or uh, in the center? Pay heed to that. Now, what we're going to look next at for this is to look at a physically approximate solution. So we're going to look at getting the same kind of solution, but we're not going to do kind of a, a lot of maths. Um, to get the previous result we had, you know, it, it takes four or five pages of um, mathematics to get through it. And uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a hairy solution. It's not the, the nicest thing to work with. It's got, you know, if you're doing calculations, it's, it, it, in there. It's got hyperbolic uh, terms. It's got, you know, this n odd. So even to do this in Excel is, um, is it takes a while to do the calculation. So it's not very convenient. Um, for the flow rate one, again, it can be reduced down into a more simplified expression. So again, this is for high aspect rates of chance or so h is less than w. So the height is small relative to the width. Uh, we see that it's got the parallel plate solution and it's corrected then for um, the effect of the sidewalls. So really what this is saying is that the, the influence of the sidewalls is to reduce the flow that would occur uh, compared to that equivalent parallel plate. And we can use that kind of understanding to arrive at an approximate solution to the flow rate as a function of pressure drop. So what we're going to do is we're going to express it in this form where we've got Q rectangular channel. So the subscript um, rectangular here is equal to the Q parallel plate one uh, with a correction factor. And that correction factor is um, arising from the presence of the sidewalls. So if I swap to um, just a blank slide, and see if I um, draw this out. Uh, just in the sketch. Um, so it just um, works. Okay, so that's our uh, rectangular channel. And uh, let's swap over to a red uh, marker. If we come in a bit, this distance here will be h over 2. Quite a bit too. And our overall height here is h. So what I'm saying is that we're focused in on this region here. And 
if we're in at a point inside here, uh, this point is as close to the sidewall as it is here. So it will feel an influence due to both. And once we go beyond H over two, we are closer to either the top or the bottom surface, and therefore the flow will be dominated by the presence of that surface. So it's really when we're inside a distance that is H over two away from the sidewalls that the effect of the sidewalls would really be manifest. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at what is the amount of parallel plate flow would be inside here uh, if there was no sidewall. And then we're going to look at reducing that down. Okay, so if I slide back to our regular slides. So what we have is this is what we get with a parallel plate. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to correct this for the presence of the sidewalls. So in a parallel plate that is H over two wide, what we get is this expression here, we um, evaluate. And what I've done is I've multiplied above and below by W so I can express it in terms of Q part L. Okay, so that's just convenience for, um, for writing there. Okay, Q part L H over two W is a flow inside that region um, that I marked out in the, in the blank slide. So. So that is the flow that is inside that region, as if there were no sidewalls present. And we have the same thing going on over on the other side. Now what we're going to do is we're going to assume that, okay, the presence of the walls gives us a reduction in the flow rate. So what we're going to assume is that there's a linear drop in flow rate due to the presence of the sidewalls. And again, what that means is that from here into here, it goes from the parallel plate value down to zero. Okay, so if I sketch that um, as best I can. So if we're a distance H over two out, we will get Q parallel out here, and this will be zero, and this distance is H over two. Okay, so we would have that uh, decrease. So from this value all the way down to zero as we move in from this point here into the sidewall. Okay, and the average flow inside here is half the base by the presence of the graph. Okay, so we can work that out and we substitute it back in. So we get this value and we have it multiplied by two because there are two sidewalls. So this gives us the Q parallel one minus 0.5 uh, H over W. Okay, so what we're saying is that the presence of the sidewalls is only felt in a region that is H over two laterally either side of the channels. Okay, so that's the only effect of the sidewalls. Other than that, it is the same as a parallel plate. And we're going to assume that there's a linear drop. And again, why linear? Because that's the easiest thing to do. Okay, so it drops off, decays linearly. And if you assume that, you end up with a correction factor of 1 minus 0.5 uh, H over W. And it turns out that that's not a bad approximation to it. So we have a solution that is of the same form um, as what we had before. Before we we're getting was 0.63 uh, h over w, and now we're getting uh, 0.5 h over w. If you modify this and you say that okay, I, linear is just a first order approximation. It's you know not physically what goes on. Um, if you look at the velocity profile in parallel plate, it's parabolic. So if you assume that there actually is a parabolic decay in velocity due to the presence of the sidewalls, uh, you can improve on this and you can get it to be 0.66. Okay, 
instead of 0.5. Okay, and you will see that in a, in a past exam that uh, students have been asked to improve on that linear uh, decay and change it to uh, a parabolic decay. And you get a much better approximation uh, due to that. You get 0.66 instead of the uh, 0 0.5. That's much closer to the value of 0 0.63. Why is the 0 0.63 uh, why is a bit different off the 0.66 with the parabolic decay? Because as you come to the corners, uh, I'll go back to my first, or sorry, this slide here. When you're in this corner here, um, you get an additional effect due to the proximity of the two walls. Okay, and that, that gives you that little um, source of error in, in the two. So your approximation doesn't quite capture that. Okay, if we look at some uh, plots as to how effective that is, we can see the parallel plate solution and then the physical approximation and then the um, the approximate value, you can see that the errors decay uh, quite substantially. So for massive ratio of four, the difference is less than 1% compared to the exact solution and less than 4% for the physical approximation to the side effects. And when you go to WH is about 20, the parallel plate approach has about 3% error. Okay, so for WH about 20, the parallel plate approach is, is fine. Uh, when you get less than that, and you're down around the WH04, um, you're better off using the exact or the uh, the approximate one that we use. Okay, I'll finish there and we'll move on later on with the next letter, lecture, excuse me, on uh, developing flows and the uniform correlation that can be used uh, to describe flows that are both developing and fully developed in arbitrary cross sections. So that will follow on in a subsequent video. Thank you for listening, and I hope you found that useful.